Tonight we uh, will be in the second part of Revelation chapter 13 as we continue our uh, study of the end times. And so as we, uh, as we try to recap each week where we're at, uh, I want to ask Stacy if he'll go ahead and throw the uh, timeline up there for us. And we'll just sort of recap that and remind you where we're at. And we've been talking about everything so far. Uh, you know, the church age, we talked about that in uh, the first couple of chapters of Revelation. And in chapter 4, we talked about the, the rapture. And then basically everything else we've seen since then has been a scene in heaven or on earth. And this has been the, seven, or the first half of the seven years of tribulation. And so right now we are in uh, a... A parentheses, if you want to call it, uh, in the book of Revelation, where John is telling us about other things that are going on during the entire tribulation, that he is just at the halfway point of the tribulation in his chronology. And so the things we're talking about with the Antichrist and Satan and Israel and the false prophet, those things go the length of the tribulation, but for the, the way that he has written and put everything, right now we are at the midpoint. We're at the halfway point of the tribulation. And so that's sort of where we are at right now. We talked last week, well, two weeks ago, we talked about Satan's attack on Israel and on the Messiah and the things that he would do there, even during the tribulation and some of the things in ancient history. We also talked about last week the Antichrist. We started talking about him. We looked at some of the things that the scriptures tell us about him, but we also looked at what the, new, what the, Revel, what the book of Revelation tells us about him in the first uh, 10 verses of Revelation chapter 13. And so that's where we uh, have found ourselves up to in this study is right now we're, we're going to be picking up in verses 11 through 18 tonight of Revelation chapter 13. And this is going to help us to uh, further see uh, some information about the false prophet. And this, for lack of a better term, the false prophet is going to be the religious leader for the Antichrist uh, during this uh, during the seven years of the tribulation. He's going to be the right-hand man of the Antichrist, and he is going to do a lot to uh, deceive people. He's going to try and get people to worship the Antichrist. And so we're going to learn a lot about him uh, tonight. But as we get started tonight, we're going to go ahead and read uh, the first, or we're going to read all of our text for tonight, and that's chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. And so that's what we're going to read. We're going to go ahead and read that, and then we'll go back and talk about uh, about this. And so it says beginning in Revelation 13, beginning with verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. And remember, the dragon is a reference to Satan, okay, uh, whenever we read it in Revelation. It says, He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf. Now that is the Antichrist. The first beast is the Antichrist, and then uh, the dragon is Satan, okay? And so it says, uh, He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. The number is 666. And so right here we get a, a glimpse into 
the man who would be the religious leader during the tribulation. Now, we don't know who this man will be any more than we know who the Antichrist will be. And so we don't know who either one of these individuals will be, but in some way, this religious leader during the tribulation will do a lot to bring the world religions together, get them under one banner, get them under one, and look at me when I say this, church, okay? Get them under one religious organization that will be, you know, would be the, their belief system, their church at that time. Uh, but nevertheless, he will do a lot to bring them together and, and get the inhabitants of the earth, as we just read, to worship the Antichrist. And so we're going to be uh, reading some about what it tells us about this man uh, throughout this uh, set of scripture. And so as you see in your notes there, we're going to look at some characteristics first of the uh, false prophet. And the first thing it says there is that, uh, that John said in verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. Now, if you remember last week when we talked about the Antichrist, we were talking about uh, him coming, the, the beast coming out of the sea. And what that was was a reference to the Mediterranean Sea, meaning that it was, he was going to be from the peoples surrounding the Mediterranean. And so that sort of gives us a little indication as to his nationality and things like that. But as you see, uh, the false prophet is going to be one that comes out of the earth. And this is a, a belief that he will be a Jew. That he'll be from Israel uh, the, that he will be an apostate Jew. And that means that he is a Jew who has basically uh, stepped away from the faith. Uh, so he's not, he doesn't, he's Jewish by uh, race, if you want to call it that, more so than by religion. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't worship God or anything like that, but because of his apostasy, uh, he, is, uh, he is the right candidate to help uh, cause uh, a lot of the havoc that will go on uh, during this time. And so he's going to be the one who helps to lead Israel uh, into the covenant that they will make with the uh, Antichrist at the beginning of the tribulation. And though for that first three and a half years, what we'll see is that things are going good for, uh, for Israel and for uh, the world as the Antichrist is starting to you know, consolidate power and gain uh, power and then halfway through he breaks this covenant with the uh, with the uh, nation of Israel and uh, at that time what we'll see is that the uh, the the false prophet at that point will reveal his apostasy he's going to basically at that point show that he is not truly Jewish as far as from a practicing standpoint of practicing the faith and so at that midpoint of the tribulation that is sort of the the tipping point you know it's the point of no return in the in the during the seven years of tribulation because this is when the covenant is broken this is when uh you know even here we see that the false prophet uh shares that or shows that he is uh not truly uh, a Jew. And so the thing is, he's able to help mislead at least the nation of Israel and, and many more uh, into uh, following the beast uh, or the Antichrist. Uh, the second thing that we see is that it tells us there that he had two horns uh, like a lamb. And this is just a, uh, a reference uh, to his authority, that he's going to have uh, some authority there. But as you know, if you know anything about uh, lambs, lambs aren't born with horns. And so it, it, it gives you the idea of what you know, Jesus talked about, the sheep uh, or the, uh, the wolves in sheep's clothing. And that's what we basically get with the false prophet. He's going to put on a good front. He's going to look like a lamb and he's going to gain all of this authority but he's really a wolf in sheep's clothing, if you want to look at it from that regard. Uh, but those horns that John references are just a reference to that authority that he'll have, that the, that the Antichrist will give him. And it says there also, the third thing, he spoke like a dragon. And this suggests that in some way he will derive his power of speech from the devil. Uh, what does that mean necessarily? It may mean that he might have a silver tongue, so to speak. He might be able to get talk anybody into anything. And uh, he might be a, a good salesman, so to speak, that he'd be able to sell uh, people on this uh, 
world religion and get them to follow the Antichrist uh, by the things that he says. And so he's basically going to be the chief spokesman for the, uh, the world religion that uh, the Antichrist is, uh, is a part of to, to pull everybody together. And if, you, if you're starting to notice, see how this works, the Antichrist is going to be consolidating that power from the kings of the world. Well, one of the things is man, as the author puts it, is incurably religious. Man wants to worship something. And that's because God has put eternity in our hearts, uh, as Ecclesiastes tells us. And so God has designed us to worship him, okay? And so God has hardwired our, has hardwired our uh, nature to desire worship, okay? And so that's why, uh, how God has designed us. And because of that, man is going to worship something. Man will worship himself, man will worship idols, or hopefully man will worship God through the blood of Christ, through their saving relationship with him. And so man is, man is hardwired to worship and specifically worship God, but like anything else, that worship can be perverted, and that's the way Satan does. He perverts the things that God has created good and holy and tries to tear them down. And so that worship may be focused on ourselves, or that worship may be focused on an idol or some false god or whatever it may be. But nevertheless, what we see is that this, uh, this false prophet is going to use that desire for worship to turn the attention of people during the tribulation to worshiping the Antichrist because of all the things he's doing and all the things he's able to accomplish. The fourth thing, uh, fourth characteristic we see about the false prophet is this. It says he exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf. And so these two leaders are going to have a real close relationship. And because of that, uh, the false prophet is going to be given some large amount of power by the Antichrist. He may be given a blank check by the Antichrist and said, here, make things happen, whatever that is. Uh, you know, that blank check may be power, it may be control, it may be whatever, but the Antichrist is going to hand over to the false prophet a whole lot of power, and, and the false prophet is going to exercise that power based on the, the growing power of the Antichrist. And so, uh, you know, this uh, during this time, his whole, I guess you would say, his entire purpose would be to work towards getting people to follow and worship the Antichrist. That's his, that's his focus during this time. And, uh, and they're going to base all of that on what the Antichrist does, what he, uh, even this false resurrection that we talked about last week. And so there's going to be a lot of power in the hands of the, of the uh, false prophet because of what the Antichrist is able to do. Uh, but the next thing that we see here, the fifth and final characteristic of the false prophet is it says he made the earth and its inhabitants worship the be the first beast and we know the first beast is the antichrist and so the false per the false prophet his uh basic operation as we as it says there in your notes uh the basic purpose and operation of his is going to he's going to use that power and he's going to use the speech of the devil and basically what he's going to do is he's going to drive people to worship the antichrist He's going to use that silver tongue from Satan. He's going to use the power from the Antichrist. And basically what he's going to do is he's going to get people focused on the Antichrist and get them to worship him. Now we think, well, how, can, how could that be possible? How would one man, even with whatever amount of power the Antichrist gives him, how in the world would he be able to convert, get people to convert to worshiping the Antichrist during all of this time? Well, you have to remember... This is a time after the church has been raptured out. So Bible-believing Christians, well, born-again Christians will not be here. Okay, so that's part of the, the void in the earth. This will be a time where people are looking for something that will fix all the problems going on around the world. And a lot of times, and I can be the, I can I could tell you story after story where when when problems happen, the first thing people do is they reach out to the church or God or the pastor. Uh, it happens a lot of times. And uh, not just when it's church folks, 
the people outside of the church. You know, well, things are going bad. I've got to reach out to the people who know God. You know, that's sort of the, that's sort of the mentality. And so uh, what happens here is the same exact thing. thing chaos has ensnarled the earth and, and ensnared the earth. And then all of a sudden, you know, here is this guy stepping up saying, look, I can give you what will bring peace to your hearts. And so at that time, what we can see is that he is starting to draw them in under the guise of religion. And so he's going to set up this, uh, this religious uh, organization that the Antichrist will eventually be able to use uh, for his own uh, worship. Now, in your notes, the next thing that we see here is it's talking about the Satanic Trinity. And uh, if you think about it, I'm, there's, there's not any fill-in on this, and so... Uh, you can just follow along with what I'm saying here. If you think about the way we have watched the, the events in Revelation unfold, you can very easily see how, uh, as I said earlier, that Satan is a counter, counterfeiter. Uh, everything that God makes, Satan will try and duplicate or counterfeit for his own use or for his own, uh, his own devices. And so when you look at it, Satan, you know, his... His sin was pride, and basically he tried to overthrow God. He tried to place himself on the throne of God. And so he automatically sees himself as one equal to God. And so we would see him as, if we were looking at it from a a Trinitarian viewpoint, we would see him as the anti-God. And then we see the one who would be opposed to the Son as the anti-Christ. And here, what we see is the religious leader, the one who is, is encouraging worship, the one who is pointing people towards the God to be the anti-spirit instead of the Holy Spirit. And so the false prophet will be the one who will be the, uh, the religious conscious, uh, conscience, the religious conscience of uh, the, the religious system that the Antichrist puts in place. And so you can see that these three will work together to do uh, to wreak havoc in a lot the same way that God uses Himself in three persons to bring people to Himself. And so uh, it will be a it will be a terrible terrible time uh, to be on the earth. But now we've read about uh, about these these powers that the uh, that the Antichrist is going to give to the. Uh, to the false prophet during this time. And so we're going to look at a little bit of those uh, supernatural powers of the false prophet. And, and not only him, but uh, not only the Antichrist, but Satan also works to give him uh, powers as well. But look at verse 13. It says, And he performed great and miraculous signs. And so somehow this, anti, or this uh, false prophet is going to be able to work some miracles. He's going to be able to do some of the things. He'll probably, you know, in good, uh, in, in not in good, but in the, uh, in the normal fashion of the way that uh, Satan works, he's probably going to counterfeit some of God's miracles that he worked, not only through Christ's ministry on earth, but we see that, um, you know, the, the words translated here for miraculous signs is the same word used by the Apostle John in the Gospels to describe the ministry of Jesus. And so what we, can, what we can gather is that the, uh, the miracles that he's going to be working are going to be duplicates or counterfeits of what Jesus did. And so this false prophet's going to be working mir- uh, miracles that look a lot like those that Jesus did. Now think about it. This goes back to what we talked about um, a couple weeks ago when we talked about how uh, there will be this collective, even though the church is raptured out, and even though there are 144,000 Jews that are, have converted to Christianity and are leading people to Christ during this time, what we see, what we talked about a few weeks ago is there will still be this collective understanding or this, this remembrance of the Christian faith by people who are here during the tribulation. They're still going to rem- they're, they'll still be celebrating Christmas, which is kind of ironic because they won't be worshiping Christ as they do it. They'll still be giving gifts. They'll probably still be uh, celebrating Easter, but not for the resurrection, for other reasons. 
And so they'll, be, they'll still remember those Christian things that they may have heard in Sunday school as a little kid, but never, never were saved. Or things that they might have heard a preacher say. Or some grandma or grandpa that, had, you know, that was a God-fearing man or woman. They will have this understanding of Christian ideas and Christian things. And so as this anti, or this, the Antichrist and the false prophet, as he is on the scene doing things that mimic... Christian miracles and Christian uh, things that they would be sort of a little bit familiar with, they're going to see this and be very easily deceived. You know, you don't have to know a whole lot about the Bible to be deceived by uh, those, the, those cults like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses because they talk a really good game and they can get you confused on, on what you believe as a Christian, much less uh, if someone who has no understanding about the, the Christian faith. And so they, during this time, the, anti, or the uh, false prophet will be doing a lot to pull people towards worshiping the Antichrist because of this understanding of some of these elements of what he is able to, uh, to manipulate and uh, manipulate people with. And some of that is uh, things that even from the ministry of Jesus. Another thing that we see there in verse 13, it says that he would be able to even causing fire to come down uh, from heaven to earth in full view of men. And this is talking about the fire test of Elijah as we would understand it. And so he's basically not only mimicking the New Testament uh, miracles and, and the happenings, he's also going old school. He's going Old Testament on them. And he's pulling you know, even this idea of the fire test of Elijah. And that will probably be shared uh, during this time. But you know, uh, one of the things that the author mentions in the book is, well, how would Satan be able to call down fire? Uh, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, only God could do. Well, in the book of Job, do we not read that Job's, uh, some of Job's belongings, some of his uh, livestock were destroyed by, by fire? And who was the one that was uh, basically causing all of Job's problems, it was Satan. And so we don't understand the supernatural powers that Satan has at his disposal. But what we do understand is that, uh, that during this time, this man, this uh, false prophet, will be able to mimic some of his. And uh, this may be, as the author puts it, this may be one of the reasons why one of the two witnesses may very well be Elijah. And so we, we'll just have to see how that uh, plays out there. But another thing that we see is that in verses 14 and 15, it says that he set up an image. He was given power to give breath to the image. And so this false prophet sets up an image of the Antichrist. He basically sets up a statue uh, of the Antichrist to be worshipped. And uh, when he does this, it's, uh, he'll he'll cause people, as it says there in your notes, to build an image like Nebuchadnezzar's image. You know, Nebuchadnezzar saw this golden statue in his dream, and he, or, I mean, he sees, this he sees a statue in a dream, and it's, it's got a gold head and silver body and on down. But after that, he goes and he has this golden uh, statue built, and it's like nine feet wide and 90 feet tall. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, and has it put out in this uh, plain just south of Babylon. And, uh, and he has people come out there to worship him, uh, worship that statue. And they're supposed to worship it whenever uh, the musicians play. And if you don't, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And as we know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're like, nope, not going to do it. Not going to worship him. And, uh, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's like, hey, I'll give you another opportunity. Uh, and he said, you know what? We're not going to do it. And even if our God doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to do it. And we know the story ends with them being thrown into the fiery furnace and being saved. God doesn't allow them to burn. And so we understand the idea of how this sort of thing can happen. And basically what will happen is the false prophet will set up a statue that will be worshipped by, uh, by people. By people here alive during the uh, during the tribulation, and somehow the interesting thing is we don't know how from what John is talking about here, and we really don't even know from today's modern technology. We don't understand how he will make this happen, but he's going to give it. Will he will give it whatever that means the power uh, to speak, uh, which is which is kind of. Uh, 
unusual when you when you really think about what it means there he says he was given power to give breath to the uh, to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed and so right here this image is going to be given life if you want to look at it it's going to be given life by the false prophet and if you don't worship that image the image can have you killed now you know, that's, uh, that's kind of scary when you think about it. Now, does that mean that this, the image, the statue, will be demon-possessed? Possibly. We don't know. Uh, we don't know what technology or what way this happens. It could be something supernatural for all we know. But what we do see is that this image uh, will be an image of the, uh, the Antichrist, and people will be forced to worship it. And if you don't worship it, you'll be killed. And, you know, just like with Nebuchadnezzar's statue, uh, those who don't worship the image will be killed. And except for the interesting thing is this image, the, uh, the statue will be the one that will allow you or have you killed, which is altogether really weird if you think about it. But nevertheless, Revelation 24, uh, 20 verse 4 later tells us uh, that those who refuse to worship the image will most likely be killed by beheading. And so, uh, you know, this is, instead of a fiery furnace, this one is going to be beheading, most likely. And so, you know, it's sort of scary when you, I'm not scary, but it's kind of interesting when you uh, consider all the power that this man is going to be given on a supernatural level. Not just the, the power that the Antichrist could give him to say, oh, you, you just get whatever you need built, you buy whatever you need, you take care of business, do all whatever you need to do. That kind of power is, you know, is, is not good for one man to have, obviously. But for him to have supernatural power uh, from Satan to go along with it, that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, uh, pretty worrisome. But the last thing we see in verses 16, 17, and 18 is talk of this mark of the beast. And he uses this mark of the beast in some powerful ways. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, what, uh, what we know about this mark of the beast from the scriptures. Uh, you know, some people have uh, done study, if you want to call it that, on uh, who the 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 666 references as far as their name and one thing and another and some some have said it was hitler some have said it was mussolini and others have said other people uh but what we realize is that if it's a, if it's since it says there and we'll, let me read this again so that so that i can make sure i'm clear on this with you it says he also forced everyone small and great rich and poor free and slave to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark which is the name which is the name of the beast or the number of his name and so that's what people were doing they were doing the math they were doing the whatever kind of study and they were figuring out that hey it's it's hitler or it's mussolini or it's whoever here is the thing None of the other things that we have read so far in the book of Revelation that talk about the rapture, the, the events of the tribulation, and all of these things, none of this has happened yet. So we don't know who the Antichrist is, so we can't do the math and understand who the Antichrist is based off of this number 666. And again, as I've said several times through this study, if you're a born-again believer in Christ, you're not going to see it in the flesh no way because you'll be raptured out and so, it, I don't want to say it's not important, but it's not something we can figure out. You know, the Bible tells us a lot of things. It tells us everything that we need to know, but not always everything we want to know, okay? And when we get to heaven, those things we want to know may not be all that important at the time. So, what we need to know, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us what's going to happen, but as far as who that person is, the Antichrist, we don't know, and we can't figure it out based on those three numbers but nevertheless you know what is this mark of the beast well these are the next few uh, fill-ins and then we'll be done for uh, the evening the first thing we know is that it comprises the numbers as i said six 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 and so this is the mark of the beast that's that's all we know and when we think of it when we you know i don't know about you but when i think the mark of the beast oh it's you know something you know it's you know, almost intimidating or scary if you want to look at it in that way. But when you think about it, the mark of the beast is this is a, this is a mark or a, a number 
given to people because of the beast, which is the Antichrist. So it's technically, if you want to look at it, it's the mark of the Antichrist, not, you know, not something that should be as fearful and dreaded as we might would think. Again, because if you're a born-again Christian, you're not going to be here anyway. Because you're either going to die and go to heaven, or you're going to be raptured out. So, nevertheless, we know that the numbers comprise three sixes. Uh, the other thing we know, uh, that six is the number of human beings. Now, in uh, what that means is, in biblical numerology, which is the study of numbers, in from a biblical standpoint, there are certain numbers that that carry um, certain significance. That's probably the best way to put it. Uh, and uh, two of those numbers that we know of very easily are the number six and the number seven. Uh, seven uh, throughout the scriptures uh, point to a uh, point to uh, perfection. Uh, and if you think about it. You know, everything in creation was created in seven days, even though God created it in six and rested on the seventh. There are the seven days of creation, and, and that is the perfect creation that God made. Uh, as far as when we think about the number six, uh, you know, when we look at that, that is in biblical numerology, that is considered to be the number of man or human beings because man was created on the sixth day. And so what, you know, what this means is that this number is referring to something having to do with mankind rather than divine, having to do with God, I think is the best way to put it. And so uh, it, is, uh, it, it is something that we, uh, that we know. Another thing, uh, this isn't on the screen, but this is in your notes, is we do not know why three digits are used. We don't know why John wrote that, that it was three sixes. Could it have been four and he didn't want to write the fourth? We don't know. But what we see is that in Scripture, inspired by Scripture, by the Holy Spirit, he wrote down three sixes. Don't know why there were only three used. Um, that was the, you know, we would think, well, that could be the, uh, you know, we think about our initials when we think about, you know, NLW. That's my, uh, my initials. And, uh, you know, we think, well, but then that would just be three letters all the same so it wouldn't really make any sense if you looked at it that regard but there are three digits used um, the bible does indicate that it somehow will mathematically speak the name of the antichrist okay we don't know how again it it's it would be speculation and i will tell you this um, and you can say this about several other things in the scriptures but if you have someone who can come to you and tell you definitively who the Antichrist is or what that mark of the beast is or what those numbers are, I will tell you to run and run fast because they have no more clue than the man on the moon. Okay? And the reason for that is it's not told in Scripture. And they say, well, God revealed it to me. Easy now. You're getting, on to, <laughs> you're, you're getting a little outside of Scripture there when you, when you start talking about that sort of stuff. So it does somehow, in this, using these numbers, it does somehow uh, tell us the name of the Antichrist. Uh, the number also will not be revealed until the halfway point of the tribulation. Again, we're not going to see it. We're not going to know about it because this is halfway through the tribulation and we're going to be raptured before the tribulation even begins. You know, some have, uh, some have talked about how it could be something like a barcode uh, type technology, you know, something along those lines that, you know, you have it on your right hand and so they would scan it or something like that. I've heard uh, or read and heard of things like that. Or even now, you know, they have uh, chips that are implanted into uh, pets or, you know, uh, things like that. And so there's a lot of technology that we may not even know about yet that would be coming down the pipe, so to speak, that could, could be used in this regard. But what we do know is that this is not going to be revealed until halfway through the tribulation anyway. Uh, the mark will be used as a means of forcing people to worship the Antichrist. And so, uh, you know, that's one of the things that uh, he does with this number. You know, it says that he forced everyone, and it tells about everybody, uh, to get the mark on, or receive the mark on his right hand or on his forehead. How would you like to walk around with, for all intents and purposes, a tattoo on your forehead of the numbers, you know, of this person's name or something like that? That's basically what he's saying. 
And so they would receive the mark on their hand or on their forehead and uh, that no one could buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast. And uh, basically, he's using this uh, eventually to force people to worship the Antichrist. Uh, also, as I just mentioned, uh, to buy or sell anything, you have to have this mark on your hand or on your forehead. And so this mark, whatever it is, uh, would uh, have to be, you have to have it to buy or sell. And so you can imagine the black market that will go on during this time for those who refuse to get this, maybe because they're a Christian and they know that they can't get it. Uh, maybe because they've already been sealed by uh, the angels that we talked about earlier in the book of Revelation. But nevertheless, they wouldn't be able to buy or sell anything. I mean, you can imagine how, how horrible a time this would be and how difficult it would be just to survive, much less do anything else. And the last thing it says, those who receive the Antichrist mark uh, will probably have made their decisions for eternity. I mean, they, they will obviously have made their uh, decisions for eternity because at that point they will have branded themselves, if you want to look at it in that regard, they will have chosen their side. Uh, indications from Scripture, uh, we sort of get the idea that once you receive either the mark of, Christ, uh, the, mark of the beast or uh, are sealed with the mark that the angels uh, will mark people with at the beginning of the tribulation, once you pick a side, you're, you've chosen your side for eternity. And so what we see there is that, and, and there will still be some that are still undecided uh, that will not pick a side. And so uh, we'll see, you know, as we go through the scriptures, we'll finish through the scriptures in Revelation, we'll see uh, references to both of those. And so uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting chapter when you look at chapter 13 and you, you get a fuller picture of this Antichrist and you get a fuller picture of the, uh, of the false prophet who will be helping him. Now next week we'll get into uh, chapter 14 and we'll uh, see what it has to say uh, about some other things going on during the tribulation.